New week, new Ricky report. Happy Monday, guys. This episode is brought to you by The Last Dive Bar. Shout out to the guys at Last Dive Bar. Oh, whoops. <laughs> For uh, hooking it up. I got the new poster. I got the calendar over here. Rearranged my wall a little bit. Got the t-shirt. Let's go. And make sure to use the affiliate link down below. Help your boy out. And use the code RICKYBLOG at lastdivebar.com. Get yourself ready for the reverse boycott on June 7th. It's going to be a great time. They're also putting on a pregame uh, event at Line 51 Brewing. So more details will come out as um, we get closer to that. But yeah, let's jump into it. Had a lot of news over this weekend. Honestly, a lot of this news broke over on Friday. And Alan Snell of LV Sports Biz shared an eye-opening report on Friday about the true financing details behind Allegiant Stadium with the Raiders. I was always under the impression that it was, um, you know, Clark County taxpayers and Las Vegas taxpayers, they were on the hook for $750 million via a raised hotel tax that, um, that was kind of championed by the late Sheldon Adelson. This is when... Uh, you know, Vegas lured the Raiders back in 2019 out of Oakland. So I was always under the impression that it was $750 million, which I thought it was a lot of money, but it turns out it's actually closer to $1.3 billion or $1.35 billion in, uh, in true debt, according to Snell. So he broke down some numbers um, with the principal and the interest that taxpayers are on the hook for. And it looks like it's going to be about $645 million in the principal, but over $700 million in interest, about $709 million in interest. So it comes to over $1.3 billion. And over the past five years since the Raiders moved there, so 2019, 20, 21, or yeah, 20, uh, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, those five years, they've paid about $176 million, but they're still on the hook for about $1.18 billion between now and 2048. So that's a big bill to pay over the next 25 years. I wonder if Las Vegas is having second thoughts about granting this $380 million to the A's because with interest, who knows, maybe it'll go up higher. And, um, you know, the Raiders are really just kind of leaving a trail of debt everywhere we go, <laughs> everywhere they go. And, um, you know, this whole Coliseum mess, at least this iteration, uh, I think you can really trace it back to the deal that, Alameda County and the city of Oakland cut with the Raiders to bring them back when um, at the time it was it was 220 million dollars which was supposed to be the cost for uh, Mount Davis and it ended up being actually about 350 million that's what the uh, SF Chronicle reported back in 2017 and I, I remember when all this stuff went down I was born in 87 so this deal went down in 95. I remember the 96 season. They actually started out in Las Vegas. So the A's actually have already played in Las Vegas. We should have known. Uh, this was like to start the season. They played an opening homestand at Cashman Field in Las Vegas. And then later in April, the Coliseum was deemed fit for MLB games, even though it was under construction. And just doing some research for this, I came across this really, really cool old uh, home video from a user on YouTube called Nick Beat. This is from May 11th, 1996. And as you can see, this, uh, Mount Davis is under construction while the game is going on. And I really liked, I just loved this, the whole feel about this, man. Like this is the Coliseum that I grew up with, with the orange seats and everything. And if you look, um, at some point he goes up to like near the Dallas Braden seat up in section 301 and he looks right over the Mount Davis and you just see, see the, all the construction workers up there and working. And if I remember correctly, I think they used to play YMCA and the construction workers will all do it and all, all the whole stadium was into it. It was like a whole thing during that 96 season, if I remember that. So... Um, for now, you know, Oakland and Alameda County are still splitting a $13 million a year uh, annual bill. So even though the Raiders left a few years ago, they're still paying it off this year and next year. Because when they left, there was $65 million in debt. So, but it'll be paid off, I believe, by next, next year, 2025. So when we see these $380 million fees, I think we should, you know, $380 million uh, price tags with the public money associated with the A's ballpark. Always take it with a grain of salt. There's probably going to be some interest. These things are going to uh, go up. And so let's take a tab of all the free money Fisher has received so far. Um, you know, so it's the $380 million. 
And ESPN reported that MLB um, waived the relocation fee when they approved the move to Las Vegas last year. And that's another estimated $300 million. I thought it was more. I thought it was like $500 million, but I guess it's $300 million. So that's up to $680 million right there. And they got uh, free rent, basically, from GLPI. But now that um, that whole situation is up in the air, but at the time, I believe it was uh, around 175 or 180 million, basically in um, tax breaks and rent rent breaks that they got. So that's what about 860 million in in, in free and free money. And John Fisher is still looking for 500 million in investing. Um, from what we can tell, it, it seems like he's committed about a billion, and then he's looking for for help for the other. Uh, 500 uh, million to make this stadium happen, but as we reported last last week on the Ricky Report, um, A's fan D, Vitamin D, he is hearing from real estate developers down in Vegas that the cost overruns are going to push this closer to 20, if not 20 percent higher, if not more. So I wouldn't be surprised if this if this thing ever does get done, that it, it's closer to 2 billion instead of 1.5. So. Yeah, uh, a lot of stuff uh, still going on here. I wonder if this, you know, thwarts any momentum. But you know, they already approved it, and the schools over stadiums referendum was struck down. So maybe the best chance to thwart the public money would be in 2025, when Clark County is expected to vote on about 120 million dollars in bonds for this project. And Speaking of uh, Steve Hill, who's kind of been the champion for, for this whole, um, as far as uh, Vegas, you know, he, he's part of the Las Vegas Stadium Authority, which met last week. We, we broke it down on Friday. And he's also the chairman of the Las Vegas Visitors Convention and Visitors Authority. And Steve Hill was in the news on Friday after this video came out. He, um, him and his convention, they, they gave the Las Vegas Aces, the WNBA team down there, an uh, extra $100,000. And here's this video from the Aces locker room that kind of went viral. Hey everybody, I'm here with leaders around Las Vegas and members of our board at the LVCVA. The Aces have been on a historic run, two-time world champions. Um, we're here to do something historic with them too. So come on in, let's take a look. Today we want to do something that is uh, new, uh, something I don't think anybody's ever done before. Um, and we want to recognize you individually. Um, we want to put some money in your pockets. Um, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got an offer for you. Um, we think it's a great offer for us, um, but we would like to offer each of you individually um, a sponsorship for this year in the amount of $100,000. <laughs> the offer is really simple. We want you to just play. We want you to keep repping Las Vegas. And if you go to three Pete, that'll be icing on the cake. So that's it. One other thing, I just want to let you guys know we have talked to everyone in your agents. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Proud of you. One, two, three. Vegas! So it's weird. So after this video came out, um, ESPN reported that. The WNBA is opening up an investigation of this to see if the Aces are circumventing the league's salary cap rules, because 100 grand is a lot of money for these. Well, it's a lot of money for anybody, but especially, um, you, you know, when you you look at NBA salaries and they're everybody's making millions. All these these scrub dudes are making you know 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year. But uh, you know, like Asia Wilson and and Kelsey Plum, they're the top players on the the most notable marketable players best players on the aces they're they're making 200 grand this year so you know 100 grand you know bumps up their salary by 50 percent and there's only six out of the 12 te uh, players on the team who are making at least six figures so that 100 grand you know more than doubles a lot half the team's salary so i don't and i don't understand what's the what's the deal here like if you know nike gives all these women you know hundred thousand dollar contracts what's the difference between that and LVCVA doing it. So I just say, hey, WNBA, back off. Let them get the money. You know, WNBA is going through this huge boom right now. Of course, the the Warriors um, announced recently that the, the ownership group behind the Warriors, Joe Lacob and company, they announced that the team here is going to be called the Valkyries. I'm honestly not too on board. I don't, I don't really know. I had to Google what a Valkyrie was. I guess it's a, a, a woman 
uh, a female uh, angel or female guardian who transports warriors from their death to, to Valhalla, something like that. But, uh, yeah, and the, yeah, the, the colors and everything, it's cool, but uh, I don't know. The Valkyries, I don't even know. How, people don't even know how to spell that thing, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, it, it'll, it'll still be really, really cool to see the WNBA in there. Um, and, yeah, Joe Lacob's about to make himself a whole lot of money. So maybe he can make that money to eventually buy the A's, right, guys? <laughs> All right, and uh, the A's continue to be in the national news cycle the New Yorker recently published an article from Louisa Thomas. Louisa Thomas, she's a sports writer for the New Yorker, and she really laid out the A situation and how it's gone down the past few years and kind of just the demise of the franchise. And um, once again, you know, it's in, an, it's, it's in national headlines, and the New Yorker's unique because I think it reaches a new audience. And who knows, maybe it reaches some new billionaires in New York who never heard of Fisher or some billionaire somewhere else who was just having a casual read and they're like, oh, what's this about? They're like, oh, this Fisher guy, I don't want to invest in him. Like, what? He's looking for investing? I don't know. That's just my tinfoil hat. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, she she wrote an article really laying out the whole thing pretty, pretty chronologically, pretty matter of fact, but at the end, this is a spoiler alert. I don't know if I should be doing this spoiler in the article, but at the end, she she talked about the renderings and how it reminded her of the Franz Kafka novel Metamorphosis. She said, when I saw the drawings, they didn't remind me of an armadillo. They reminded me of an insect, specifically the one described by Franz Kafka in The Metamorphosis, in which a man named Gregor Samsa wakes up and sees that his belly, become, his belly has become dome-like and divided into stiff arch segments. Samsa, we learn, has undergone a horrible transformation. He eventually dies of neglect. Fiend. <laughs> so, honestly, I read that. I was supposed to read that book in high school. I remember. Sorry, Mr. Duffy. I, <laughs> I, I don't think I did. I think I, I read Cliff Notes. That's when Cliff Notes was a thing. And I don't really... I remember it was something about this guy he turns into a, a beetle. And I don't remember <laughs> i don't remember exactly what happened but uh anyways i guess the new yorker is not on the uh is not on the john fisher hype train so um you know this is the latest article that we've seen in national media of course dan moore read, wrote a great article about it in the ringer tim cam in espn ken rosenthal of the athletic have all been writing about this situation over the past year or so and also, you know, media landscape is really changing. Um, a lot of the, the biggest media personality, especially for the younger generation, has to do with YouTube. And of course, we had Gabe Hernandez on the episode 92 last week. Make sure to check that out. We talked about Gabe and his whole creative process, Gamer Athletics, subscribe to his channel. But, you know, a couple other YouTubers, have, popular YouTubers have been there recently. Troy Dan is another guy that Gabe saw down at at Diamond Level, he kind of wrote, uh, he did a whole kind of satirical, funny look at the Coliseum and just how it's gone downhill over the years. And then also, there was a YouTuber recently, his name is Daniel Dan Sarmiento, uh, DSR, DS, DSARM on YouTube. And he, he went to Oakland for a couple of games when the Marlins were in town a couple of weeks ago, and he interviewed a bunch of fans about their their feelings about the situation. He interviewed Brian, uh, Johansson, Coco Crisp, Grant Balfour to make this little mini 22-minute documentary about the whole situation. I thought it was really well done. Definitely check it out. And so, yeah, you know, this this attention isn't going away from Fisher. The, this uh, this is definitely in the national in the national li um, landscape and. You know, we're expecting, you know, Steve Hill said we're expecting a development agreement in June in, in July. So these next couple months, it will can, this whole season really will continue to see the A's continue to be in the national spotlight. And the Coliseum also had some new news with the Oakland Roots and Seoul. As Jonathan Como of the Oakland Roots blog reported on Friday, the uh, Oakland Alameda County Coliseum Authority approved a resolution by a six to nothing vote to negotiate an event licensing agreement between the Joint Powers Authority and the Oakland Roots and Soul to play its matches at the Oakland Coliseum for the 2025 season. I thought it was a done deal, but apparently it wasn't. So thanks to Jonathan for this report. He shared some interesting notes from the 
from the meeting and the vote. I guess the final budget approval will come in June, so next month. And he also shared some terms of the agreement, some key things that I thought was that it's capped at 34 days between March of next year, 2025, February 2026. So basically the whole calendar year, they got 34 days for the Roots and the Soul. And this year the Roots had 17 home games and the Soul have six home games. So that's 23 total. So I think there should be plenty of... Uh, ample opportunity for them to host their entire seasons there in 2025. And the Roots and Soul are also trying to build a modular interim stadium at Malibu Lot by 2026. I went on Reddit and found some renderings here, some some renderings to take a look, because who, who doesn't love some renderings? So this, uh, if you don't know where the Malibu Lot is, um, often pretty much mostly used is used for Raiders games when they were here when there was really, really big lots. There's like an overflow gravel lot on the southeast corner of the Coliseum parking lot. So they're planning on building there a 10,000 seat stadium by 2026, but next year they get to play at the Coliseum, which I think is really, really awesome. And about three weeks ago, Oakland side reported that the city of Oakland is trying to buy Alameda County's half of the Malibu, or excuse me, of the Raiders um, practice facility. That's another thing that the, the Roots are trying to do is get the Raiders practice facility. And Oakland's also trying to buy the county's half of the Malibu lot. So the Oakland is totally on board with the Roots. It's just Alameda County has been kind of slow with approvals. And uh, it's the guys that uh, the Summer of Cell documentary pointed out a few months ago that Nate, uh, Nate Miley last year you know, got a $10,000 donation from John Fisher. So he's been kind of painted as this John Fisher sympathizer throughout this whole process. And Alameda County is really dragging its feet on this decision. But, you know, the roots and the soul, they really want this uh, practice facility in Alameda so they can set up their home base there and then play their games at the Coliseum and then Malibu Lot and then eventually find a long-term home. You know, I love when they're at Laney. And for right now, they're, they're still playing Cal State, East Bay, and Hayward. But uh, also the Summer Cell Doc guys also mentioned did some connecting of dots, saying that, you know, basically implying that perhaps Fisher was behind some dark money, or was behind some money that was putting um, a bid in for the STEM organization that was also putting in a bid for the, Ala, uh, for the Alameda Raiders facility. But of course, you know, Fisher has an interest in the Town FC, which is now the minor league team for the San Jose Earthquakes. So maybe he's viewing that as a practice facility for the, the town. And... You know, the Bay FC women's team also, I don't know if they have a dedicated practice facility, but they play their home games at PayPal Park. So, you know, it seems like a logical training facility for the next wave of soccer soccer teams here. So we'll have to see if it'll be the Roots or the Soul or the Town FC and perhaps Bay FC. But, yeah, hopefully the Oakland Roots and Soul get it. You know, I really like what they're doing and super dedicated. And I think, man, the atmosphere at the Coliseum is going to be, it's going to feel big in there. But I'm really excited to see what it's going to be going to be like and the roots and the soul are going to have to pay for the new field to put it in there so hey we got some baseball news too kind of <laughs> the a's are on an eight game losing streak which is not great they just got swept out of kansas city this weekend a three game set and it was kind of brutal that they the, the royals were um, celebrating their 2014 team and that that game still brings up harsh memories. I mean, honestly, I think it's up there with the Jeter flip as far as, you know, terrible losses in, in this 2000s era of, of, of games. And also, yeah, the, I don't know, those games against the, the Tigers were also pretty rough, those series against Scherzer and Verlander. But, whew, that 2014, if you were to pick a, a, a game, that, 24, that, that 2014 game was really a heartbreaker. I mean... They were losing, they came ahead, they were winning um, in extra innings, and then the 12th inning, they, they give it up. They, they score a run, and they give up two runs. Brutal, absolutely brutal. We don't need to relive all that, but anyways. Um, so yeah, they got swept out of Kansas City, and then earlier last week, they got swept out of Houston. They've now lost eight in a row. And it could have been a lot, it looked better than it really was, actually. So they lost eight to four yesterday on Sunday. But they were losing 8-1 to one pretty much the whole game. The A's were down on their final strike before Rooker hit this absolute bomb that nearly reached the scoreboard out in left field. And <laughs> on Friday night, the A's did the same thing. Shea Langoliers was down in his final strike, two outs, top of the ninth, two outs. And he hit a dinger to make it a 6-2 to two game instead of 6 to nothing. Is this the tiger? So 
They easily could have got outscored by five more runs. But right, as it stands right now, they've been scored, outscored 49-17 to 17 on this eight-game streak, pretty much an average score of 6-2. to two. And their rotation is, a, is, you know, they're in patchwork mode right now. Mitch Spence went four and two-thirds on his first MLB start on Friday. But, you know, the A's staff is really hurting. Brandon Belak made his debut, but he had a really ugly uh, debut. And before he got acquired, uh, you know, as, as a trade off the Astros after getting DFA'd, Kotze was saying that Belak would be a candidate for, um, for the starting rotation, too. So... Getting pretty rough without Paul Blackburn, Alex Wood, and Joe Boyle. Blackburn, of course, has a foot injury. Wood has shoulder injury, and Boyle has a lower back thing. And Boyle's on the rehab assignment in Las Vegas. I saw on the A's transaction page, but he hasn't. he's yet to pitch for them. And Luis Medina is also coming back from a, a right knee MCL sprain. And he, he'll be eligible to come back in a week, but he's currently with, um, with, with the A's in Arizona, so he's just getting built back up. I assume he'll be down in Arizona for a bit and then maybe go on a rehab assignment, so it's probably still a, a few weeks away. And the number one, pro we did get some news on the number one prospect, Jacob Wilson. He is he has a right knee tendonitis, so I don't know how long he'll be out, but he's on the injured list for now. About the only good news for the A's is that Abraham Toro and Brent Rooker are first and second in the league in all of baseball in May with hits. Toro has 27 and Rooker has 24. And they are doing something for the A's. <laughs> Who knows? See how long they're, they're around town for. Um, but if they keep losing like this, I don't know. Who, who's going to want Brent Rooker? Maybe someone's going to want Brent Rooker, huh? I think him and Mason Miller probably be trade, trade chips at some point. Uh, Miller made an appearance on Sunday. I mean, it's too bad. He's losing all these games. He can't get regular work. Um, but he, he just needed seven pitches to get out of uh, to get three outs on Sunday. He lowered his ERA to 0 0.93 and now has an 18 and a third scoreless inning streak. So Mason Miller getting it done for sure going to be the A's All Star this year. And last but not least, Celty Man is here. <laughs> uh, A's superhero Celty Man dressed out in full body green suit with the Celty flag made his debut. At the Beta Breakers in uh, Beta Breakers in San Francisco this weekend, and hopefully we'll be seeing him at the upcoming homestand. The A's will open up tomorrow. I forget who they're playing. Let me pull it up here. But they are. Oh, they're going to be hosting the Rockies tomorrow on Wednesday and Thursday before the Astros come to town this weekend. Sell the team energy was strong this weekend at Kauffman Stadium. It was, you know, fans were wearing the, the cell team shirt, cell team flags. It was inside the stadium. It was outside the stadium. And it wasn't only at Kauffman Stadium, the big K, as they call it. Uh, fan also shared a picture. Fans also shared pictures from Wrigley, Wrigley Field in Chicago and Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia. And Anson Casanaris uh, of the Oakland 68s, VP of the Oakland 68s, even brought a cell flag to EDC in Las Vegas this weekend. So... Cell flag is going nationwide, folks. Its next stop will be in Tampa Bay when the A's are going to be playing the Rays. So the Oakland Ballers won their spring training game against the Yellow High Wheelers on Saturday in Davis. And on Saturday, they will be hosting a watch party at the Downtown Athletic Club. So I'll definitely be there tomorrow with my camera, checking it out. So make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks again to Last Dive Bar for hooking it up with a special package. Make sure to go to lastdiver.com using my referral link below. Use the uh, promo code RickyBlog. We'll be back tomorrow with another Ricky Report. I'm Alex Espinoza. Thanks a lot for listening.